Hello, I'm Judy Skyvoss. Thanks for joining me for this October edition of Local Image. We've enjoyed featuring many talented people on the show over the years, and today we bring you the story of a Vannis Heights man who is using his artistic talents to share much more than just beautiful artwork. Producer photographer Lou Lee captured the colors of his inspiring story for this Local Image segment. As an American, I'm sure a lot of us struggle with preserving certain element of our culture. And in this painting, I want to show that, you know, due to time and space, it is really, really difficult to hold on to certain element, certain aspect of our culture. So in this painting, I'm showing two hands trying to hold on to a neck piece a necklace. Uh, this is not any typical necklace, it's actually a Hmong necklace. And it's, uh, this is what I use uh, to inspire from. And so this pia, it's, it's, it's called sola. The hand is trying to hold on to it, but the neck piece have so many sharp, sharp edges and it's actually cutting the hand and the hand is going to be bleeding. Um, so blood is dripping down the, the necklace is going onto the hand, it's holding on, the hand is grabbing onto it, but it's carrying so much weight that blood is dripping because the hand's all cut up. I believe that, you know, my identity is based on certain culture norms and cultural values. And the Hmong people, we have a few of those. Bami Nai is a refugee camp. It's one square mile by one square mile. And at the peak of all the people coming there to live there, there were about 50 plus thousand people living in one square mile. And that was really hard. The condition was horrible. And so to be a young person growing up in that camp was not fun. Um, though we don't know anything or we don't know better, it still was not fun. And so for me, um, I feel like art saved me. The one thing I do look forward to every night is uh, my father. He's a great storyteller. And so uh, he would gather all the kids every evening, every night, and, and tell stories. And so uh, being the person that I am, um, I, I conceived all these images in my head, and I didn't know what to do with it. And so uh, I wanted to get these images from my dad's story out. And so I remember uh, asking my father, Dad, uh, Mom, can you buy me paper and pencil? you know, pen, so that I could just draw, I don't know, get these images out. Um, and because we're so poor, most, all of us were so poor in the camp, um, we couldn't afford it. I have uh, 10 siblings, I actually 12, two girls and 10 boys, and I'm number 10 of 12 kids. So me being the, the, the in-between child is really difficult for my parents. Uh, Oh, and me. Uh, I, I was too young um, to go to school and I was too old to be baby by my parents because I still have two little ones for them to take care of or they still have two little ones. When I made it to the United States in the summer of uh, 1984 and I began school in the third grade uh, because having come directly from a camp I never had formal schooling, uh, didn't know the language, didn't know the culture. It was just expected that we have to go to school. And uh, so I went to school, and the only way I got there was my cousins. They're, they came here longer than I did and were in the same age, so they could get me to the bus stop, get me to the school. But after that, there's, I, didn't, I didn't know what to do other than trying to pick up the pattern and, and I don't know, learn to do the things I need to do in, in the classroom or in the school. Most of it was didn't have a clue. I remember um, going back to visit my third grade teacher after I graduated from college. I wanted to invite her to my, um, my senior show. And I called the school and said, uh, is Miss Erickson still there? And they're like, yes, she is. And I'm like, um, I was a former student some years back. Can I come and surprise her? Because I want to invite her to my senior show. And the moment I walked into the door, um, Instead of me surprising her, she actually surprised me. Uh, when I walked in, she saw me and she said, hey, the artist, you're back. 
It's really difficult for me to say that I have any sort of talent. Um, I just kept doing these things, drawing and painting and, and art, because I just love to do it. Uh, at times I have friends who said, oh, she's saying you're really good at this. I have teachers who say you're really good at this. But because I was brought up to where my parents never complimented me, or in the Hmong tradition, it's difficult for the elders to give praises because they believe that um, um, any kind of praise will prevent future accomplishment. And so they try not to praise their kids so that they could keep raising the bar. My hope has always been to capture elements of what it means to be Hmong. Um, those of you who don't know the Hmong people, we have been semi-nomadic for the past 300 plus years. And so we never settled in one particular place for a long time. And because of that, we have always adopt and assimilate. And so growing up in America, where at one point they said America is, is a melting pot. You know, whoever you are, when you come in, we all would blend together. And so it got me to think, instead of me blending in, what elements can I preserve so that I'm still uniquely mom? Yet, I am very American. One of my favorite painting is the uh, Hmong woman sewing the uh, uh, pandang. It's, it's a small piece, it's only 18 by 24 inches, uh, but it's, it has 24 karat gold, pure silver, uh, and copper highlights. And the reason why I created this piece was because um, I want to honor the Hmong women for their dedication, their commitment to, toward preserving uh, the oldest Hmong art form that we know of today and that is the Hmong Pandang. And so uh, when I created this piece, uh, I want to show that she is golden. Because without her, uh, the art that we all know today, the story cloth, the Pandang would not be what it is. Uh, and so my painting, that painting meant a lot to me because um, it's the one painting that I feel is long overdue and that is honoring the Hmong woman for all that they have done. Lately, I've been creating more uh, 3D sculptural form, specifically metal forms. Um, and I, I move away, a little bit away from drawing and painting, but this transition is not new. Um, I actually studied more 3D work during my college years. It's just that my love has always been uh, drawing and painting. And you know, when you love something, you're more comfortable at it. And so with the transition, my goal is simple, is it's just to try something new. Um, Try something different. My work are all around the Twin Cities, uh, both in private and public institutions. You can find a few of my work at Concordia University, St. Paul, uh, at McAllister College. A piece of my sculpture is at North Point Health and Wellness Center on the north side, side of Minneapolis. Uh, a big community art piece is currently at CAPI. Uh, the Hmong Cultural Center has a few of my work as well. The advice I could give to upcoming artists is that you are amazing and resilient and then you do have something wonderful and unique to offer and share to this world of ours. Just continue to practice your skills, uh, surround yourself with people who will support you and who have similar interests to yours. And soon enough, I'm sure the, the, the stage will be yours to showcase you. I'm pleased to welcome another member of the Vanness Heights community to our show. Today, I'm joined by the new Executive Director for the Vanness Heights Economic Development Corporation, Ling Becker. Welcome, Ling. And Thank you. Con congratulations on your new position. Thank you. You've been in that position for how long now? Um, probably about eight weeks. Just very yes. new. Yes, very new. And a lot of our viewers might remember that uh, Keith, Ren uh, Keith Warner, a really good friend, had been in that position mm -hmm. for a number of years and really mm -hmm. helped to build the VHEDC up mm -hmm. over that time. And unfortunately, he lost his uh, battle, last battle to cancer mm -hmm. uh, almost a year ago now. Mm -hmm. So some big shoes to fill, yes. but I know he's rooting for you mm -hmm. to take up where he left off. So tell folks what the VHEDC does. Well, the VHEDC is interested in um, 
enhancing the business environment in Badness Heights and the surrounding areas. We want to partner and be a conduit of information for businesses that might be interested in locating in Badness Heights, expanding, or doing some um, expansion in Badness Heights. We work closely with the city, and we're also creating new partnerships with um, the Greater MSP, with um, Minnesota Economic and Development Organizations. So, you know, we want to be able to have our business, businesses be able to leverage some of the financial resources and other business resources that are available to businesses to grow. Okay. Well, tell folks a little bit about yourself and what drew you to want to be in this position. Well, my whole life I've worked in um, some sector of government, actually. I was actually, even when I worked as a private consultant, I was a a government industry consultant. So when I was about 14 years old, I worked at the ice rink at our local um, city hall over in Eden Prairie. And literally, I worked my way up through city hall up to the city manager's office oh by the time goodness. I was in, you know, high school. And I had an internship there. And then I left there and, you know, obviously finished my education. And I did an internship at the Met Council. And I've just always been interested in the way that governments kind of work and how they serve the community. And it's really a great way to um, kind of complement that type of um, interest in my life. I feel to kind of work, be able to be on the other side and kind of partner b businesses to be able to, you know, bring successful things to communities through business and pro um, nonprofit and government partnerships. And in looking at that from your perspective, what about Vadness Heights and, and the business community mm -hmm. there? really drew you to mm -hmm. it. I mean, what is it about that community that is really speaking to you? Well, I think Venice Heights is ex it's, it's an extraordinary community. What's really unique about it is that there's very committed business owners. It's a urban yet kind of a small town feel um, climate. And so, you know, for the, so many business owners to be so in interested and invested in the business climate to want to kind of self-organize themselves and to self-support an organization like ours with very little, you know, government funding or any other um, really sources of revenue. They the businesses really have funded this program to, you know, create a thriving business economy for the local community. And I think that's really unique. There's not many development corporations in Minnesota. That's for sure. Well, what is the climate like, particularly in Badness Heights, mm -hmm. and kind of what what are your businesses, you know, what are some of their concerns? What are yeah. they seeing mm -hmm. down down mm -hmm. the pipeline here? Well, we're really excited about a lot of growth. Obviously, people have seen a lot of healthcare organizations coming into Badness Heights. We're opening our third hotel, you know, that just opened this month. So that's really exciting. There's some really um, big things happening yeah. in Badness Heights now. From a lot from a employer standpoint, I think they're concerned about workforce, being able to um, continue to have, find a good supply of um, qualified workers is a big concern, particularly for our manufacturers. And so we're trying to create some new ideas and partnerships, maybe with Century College or with different organizations to be able to help at least address some of those concerns. Mm -hmm. Another area would be transportation. Um, I'm sure a lot of people can see the park and ride going up in um, along um, County Road E and Highway 35 there, but that's just one small part of the puzzle. You know, um, it's, that's a commuter service. Mm -hmm. it, we need to look at ways that we can help get people to work in Vadness Heights as well. And so um, suburb to suburb transportation service is, is a priority for us to look at as well. What would you like to say to some of the businesses out there in, our, in, the, in the Vadness Heights community mm -hmm. and maybe outskirts of mm -hmm. that? about the VHEDC and mm -hmm. why it's of value yeah. to them. Well, we want to tell you that we want you to join our group. We want to be a resource for you. We are a conduit of information. We want to help you network. We want to help you grow your business. We want to help you connect better with the city. We want to help you um, think through some of your business issues, connect you with other like-minded business owners and leaders, and be able to create a community business environment that helps everybody to, to be successful. Mm -hmm. And I know you, uh, the organization offers a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. through, 
you know, workshops mm -hmm. and seminars, mm -hmm. especially events. And I know mm -hmm. you have an exciting event, a couple of them coming up here in uh, in this month and next month. Yes. October, you have, you're sponsoring a candidate forum. Yes. It, as a service to the community, we're partnering up with uh, League of Minnesota um, voters, or Le League of Women voters, I'm sorry, on White Bear Lake. And they're, we're going to co-sponsor a Meet the Candidates forum for the um, Venice Heights mayor and for the city council candidates. Okay, and then in November is the big annual um, business dinner, which is always a great event. We've covered that several mm -hmm. times. What are you looking forward to? That'll be your first one. Yeah, we're looking forward to just a great evening of celebrating business in Vadness Heights and in the surrounding areas. And so it's a great night for the businesses to kind of get together, be able to honor a couple businesses for outstanding community achievement. And we're um, as one of the highlights, we're having uh, Joe Schmidt from KSTP News be our keynote speaker as well at that event. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, VHEDC is doing a lot of great things for the business community mm -hmm. and for the community mm -hmm. as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys are always involved in different, um, you know, operations, different uh, charity mm -hmm. events in the mm -hmm. in the city and that kind of thing. Too. Yeah, that's very true. And so, actually, quite you know, interestingly enough, on my first event that I attended as an executive director was the Relay for Life where we made a large donation in honor of Keith's name. So even though I have never met Keith myself, I mean, his legacy lives on both in the energy of our board members. The, you know, I've, I've rarely met somebody along the way in the last few weeks in my work that didn't know Keith, wasn't inspired by Keith. And Keith was a connector of people. And I think that really is what the VHD EDC is, you know, for a small, smaller community to have such a vibrant business community that wants to stay connected and be connected. I think that's everything that Keith would have wanted to leave behind in, in this organization. And I think Keith would agree with me that you are an excellent person for this position. And I know you're going to do some great things with the VHEDC in uh, the many years to come. So congrats again on Thank your you. new position. And if people want to find out more about the VHEDC, where would you like to point them to? Well, please check out our website. It's www.vhedc.com. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Ling. You're welcome. All right. And I'll be back with another studio guest in just a moment, so stay with us. Hey, Minnesota, it's election year, so let's get ready to vote. MNVotes.org can help. First, check if you're registered to vote at your current address. If not, register to vote online. Then, check out your sample ballot and learn about the candidates and issues. Use the polling place finder to see where you vote or avoid the polling place by voting early before election day. Request your absentee ballot online. Your vote starts at mnvotes.org. There's a nonprofit organization serving Ramsey County that is expanding its operation and opportunities for employment for those who often face barriers in the job market. It's called Tech Dump. And here to tell us more is Amanda LaGrange, Director of Marketing with Tech Dump. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Now, Tech Dump has been around for a while, but there's some exciting news to tell folks about the organization. So go ahead. Sure. We've been in the electronics recycling world since 2011, but just last week we opened our second location, which is in St. Paul in the Midway area and gives us a lot more reach within Ramsey County. We had been in uh, Golden Valley for the past year, so a little bit farther east on the metro. So what does that mean to, to folks who live in Ramsey County? Absolutely. Anyone can stop by our location. We're open Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. No appointment needed. They can pull up We'll get them unloaded and they can be on their way. What does that mean, unloaded? What are you, yeah. what is Tech Dump all about? Just like the name sounds, we see a lot of technology, <laughs> a lot of old, dusty computers. So a lot of people will kind of find their basement or closet stockpile of computers, cables, cords, phones. We see a lot of printers, stereos. Really, it's anything with a cable, cord, or battery okay. that's not a home appliance. And so we accept all of that for electronics recycling. The only items that have a charge are those old tube TVs and monitors, the big old ones, the hard front. We do have to charge for those, okay. but everything else is free to recycle and tax deductible because we're a nonprofit. Um, I think people are getting better and better about doing this recycling stuff, um, but what are you finding? Because you guys are in the business. Absolutely. We're seeing more and more people realizing they should recycle. So that's 
progress, uh, especially the smaller devices. It's really easy to think, you know, it's really inconvenient to take this somewhere. I have an old, uh, old iPod. I'll just throw it in my trash bin and somebody else can take care of it. But the EPA reports only about 25% of consumer electronics are recycled, okay. which still feels yes. really low. Uh, but it's exciting to have this second location because the more convenient it can be, the more likely Absolutely. someone is to stop by. Absolutely. And the really cool thing is that this nonprofit organization mm -hmm. does some good things for some folks who really need a leg up when it comes to employment. Tell us about that part of the operation. Sure, we kind of give people a reason to be proud of their junk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we employ people that have a background that makes it hard for them to find other jobs. Maybe that's that they've spent time in the justice system, they're in recovery from various addictions. They don't necessarily have that track record on the resume that makes it compelling to hire them. So our employees will come and work for us typically for about a year. We make sure that when they're ready to move on to employment outside of our walls that they show up to work each day. They're productive members, they work well with others, they respect their managers, just those basic job skills. But to be able to say, yes, we know them, even when you look at their background, Maybe mm -hmm. it hasn't been the most positive, but they've changed, they've take the, taken these steps. But we truly fund it through electronics. So for the more electronics we recycle, the more people we can employ. That's really a cool thing. That is very cool. And what, has, what have you guys seen in terms of um, how it's helped some of the folks? Can you speak to any stories on that? It's amazing. It's such an honor to do what we do. And the stories, you kind of sit back and you think, wow, we get, I get to be a part of that. So there's a lot, of, a lot of pride that comes there. There are stories of people that perhaps were their first job uh, or for, first honorable position because of some of the things in their past where maybe they don't realize that on a day that they're sick, they do know to call in, but they call a manager at five o'clock in the morning because they want to make sure right. that they're not in trouble for missing a day of work. Uh, so it's amazing to see that, but to see people take steps of kind of showing that they do have hope in that future of their finding maybe their first apartment on their own or getting transportation outside of public transportation. We've mm -hmm. had employees that have gotten married. Just those steps right. of showing kind of life is, is stabilizing. It's feeling more kind of what the rest of the world thinks of as just a typical day. Very so it's cool. really, really exciting. And something else that's very interesting and, and kind of fun is the fact that the building that you're moving into kind of bridges the, the past with the present. Um, tell us about that. Sure. It is just a phenomenal story. We had no idea when we were looking at locations, but um, it's one of kind of the, the birthplaces of technology within the state of Minnesota. There were supercomputers and all sorts of, of fun gadgets made there long ago uh, and kind of I like to point out a great story of reuse and repurpose that we kind of we reuse and repurpose electronics we repurpose a lot of people and now with this building that has a long history in the technology world is kind of helping helping clean up some of the past That's as well awesome. yeah. so remind folks um, where they can find you and just some of the details and um, any other place of information that they should look for? Sure. Our website has a wealth of information, especially covering questions on how do I know if my data is safe? What do you accept? What has the charges? Uh, so we're at techdump.org mm -hmm. and that information is available. And then the, our new facility in St. Paul is open Monday through Friday, 830 to 430 at 698 Prior Avenue North. So not too far from the new green line at Prior and, and okay. University, about okay. a half, half mile off that. And, and you guys are open, but there is a celebration, a ribbon cutting happening. When is that? October 28th. So a Tuesday afternoon from 4 to 6.30, we'll be throwing a hopefully pretty big party to celebrate that second location and food, hard drive crushing, all sorts of fun. Excellent. And it is important to let people know, you mentioned it briefly, that the data, you guys go to great lengths to make sure that things are secure. Correct. So if we are able to reuse and repurpose, all data is wiped following the Department of Defense standards. A lot of the older, dust, older, dustier electronics that come to us are physically shred. So yeah. either way, all data is guaranteed. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing the information and good sure. luck with the ribbon cutting. Thank you so much. All right.
Now, last month we took some time to officially celebrate community media here in the Northeast suburbs. Suburban Community Channels is 30 years old and Government Television Network is 20 years old this year. We had a weeks long open house with special activities happening throughout the week, including our annual Excellence in Community Television Awards celebration held at Kellerman's Event Center in White Bear Lake. We'd like to share some highlights with you from that event right now. Welcome to our annual Excellence in Community Television Awards, and thank you for helping us celebrate tonight 30 years of community television in these communities. And we are here because you, because everybody in the community has taken an interest in what community media is all about. And community media, we are a family. We, we, we believe in what we're doing. We believe in the free speech that the great platform that community media and the SEC has given everybody in the community. We will move forward into our SCC Awards. Well, thank you for being here tonight. We look forward to seeing you at the facility tomorrow and every day thereafter. Thank you very much. Well, that's all the time we have for this October edition. Please join me in November for more great local stories. Until then, have a happy spooky Halloween. And as always, I do thank you for watching Local Image.